the RTE Rugby World Cup podcast, sponsored by Bank of Ireland. Hello and welcome along to the RT Rugby World Cup podcast, our second World Cup final preview of the week here on Tuesday. We spoke to Mike McCarthy and BJ Botha, which obviously had a naturally big focus on the spring box today. Bernard Jackman with us as usual and also our old friend James Parsons. James, we were going to invite you back on last week for a bit of a gloat after the quarter final, but it was all just a little bit too raw for us at the time. We said we might have to give it another week or so, but look, you're in the final, so we said we'd have to get you on now. How are things? You're getting on well? Yeah, good, mate. Um, oh, what a quarter final, just briefly. You know, like there's a there's a country that is extremely proud, but I think that's testament to where this Irish team is. Yeah, they've missed out, but, you know, they are still uh, ranked really highly in the world, um, and it shows the growth of Ireland rugby, the, the respect that was shown by... Not only the All Blacks, but pretty much every team they came up against. Yeah, it was it was a brilliant game. In fairness, when we look back at it, um, we will move on quickly though because the the excitement for the final, I think, even in the last ten or fifteen minutes, has just been driven up a few notches. <laughs> just before we came on to to record this this morning, Springboks team dropped. New Zealand won't be naming until a good bit later on in the in the evening. But South Africa named what they say is their most experienced ever lineup. And Razi Erasmus and Jack Nina were going absolutely all out here. Two changes to the starting 15. Fafta Clark and Andre Pollard come in. Manny Libok and Kobus Reinach dropped entirely from the 23 because they've gone for a 7-1 split on the bench again. Trevor and Yakanya comes in for Vincent Koch as the replacement uh, tight head. Jean Klein and Jasper Visa also drafted in there. Burners talk about going for it in a final 7-1 split and, and not only that but leaving out the, the halfback combination that you had starting throughout the quarter and semi-final To be honest I actually didn't see this coming obviously leading into the Ireland game there was all kinds of talk about potentially a 7-1 but I thought that experiment was was dead I actually didn't think it didn't work Um, in terms of Ireland they obviously finished very strong but and there was no early back injuries to exploit it, but they didn't get the result. And, and I thought that was just an experiment that they'd, they'd done with. Um, so to make this call, if it happens, I'll be I'll be shocked if there's not a a, a late calf strain uh, before a warm-up. I just think it's too big a gamble um, when there's no need to gamble. You're already getting massive impact from your from your 6-2 split. Um, and it's been a big part of the box, beating France in particular and, and, and I think beating England. So... I don't know why he would go to this. It's fascinating. It's all everyone's going to be talking about today for the all black coaches now. You know, it gives them um, a different dilemma to, to 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 try and problem solve for. But wow, it's a it's a brisk. Like, and I look at I, I don't I'm not surprised to see Faf de Turk and Andre Pollard start. But I thought uh, Ryan Ark and Libok um, or one of them would have been on the on the bench anyway. Um, so yeah, and Jasper Visa, while I rate him, has been has been kind of out of favor and also. Vincent Koch did brilliantly, you know, uh, with Ock, Ox N- N- Nisha off the bench last weekend. So it's just Sean Klein back in. Uh, Quagga has been brilliant off the bench. Dion fouri has been uh, very good off the bench. But yeah, I just don't know why you would gamble. I know it, it looks good. It's a bit of a flex, but um, I think there's an inherent risk against uh, the All Blacks. Uh, and this may be, if, if it happens 7-1, if, you, if it goes 7-1, it may be the rock they perish on. If out of curiosity, quickly, if there was to be a little late change in the warm up before the match, would it be Reinach or Pollard or Reinach or Libach coming in? Um, I think it'd be Reinach because he can play play wing and they have goal kickers. Yeah, I think Libach's. I, I look, I think Libach's confidence is probably shot. You know, but um, I, yeah, I think they could do another back on, on that bench. James, like to to sum up how how recently the, the team was named like you actually hadn't realised before you logged on to the call we just told you off air before we before we hit record and and your re- reaction I have to say was something else as well <laughs> it's just a kind of a <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, I, I've said it previously on uh, the podcast I do here in New Zealand like he's a, <laughs> you've got to love him like he is he's a unique man and, and he, he just lives his life and I suppose the Springbok side just do everything their way and, and they don't really care what anyone else uh, says or thinks. Um, I have to agree. Um, I think the moment you assume that this is what Russie's going to do um, is the moment that he'll pull another trick out of his hat. So 
And I think we've seen, you know, a lot of innovation if it wasn't lights, if it wasn't coaches calling HIAs. Uh, you know, I don't think this story's all said and done just yet, but it'll definitely make uh, the All Blacks think. But I don't think they'll be too surprised, like 6-1, 6-2, 7-1. The risk is probably with South Africa. Uh, we've got another code over here, Rugby League. Obviously, you, um, it's big in the UK as well, but uh, there's a thing called State of Origin, and, and the New South Wales Blues always struggle against the Maroons. So the New South Wales Blues took a big gamble on their bench and, and didn't have, um, I suppose, cover in, their, in and around their big forwards. They took some halves and so forth and didn't um, sort of look after the outsides. And in the end, it cost them the game because they got an injury straight in the position they needed their usual sub in. So that's the only risk, you know, if, if um, anyone goes down, who can actually play in the backs? I know, you know, Quagga's got a sevens history and maybe he's suited, but if if one of your, I suppose, your nine or, or, or ten go down or two in that position, you you, you will be really um, uh, caught short, I believe, especially if conditions are wet. You, you're going to need a good tactical kicker. Uh, it's going to be a big part of it. That's why I think the Pollard... The Kirk um, is perfect. Like that's what I would have gone with personally, just because the conditions are going to be wet. Um, but man, if they get an injury early out back, it'll, it'll make for a long day. Yeah, and Birch, like that's something we touched on before South Africa played Ireland as well, and we kind of caveated it by saying the stakes weren't as high that day because South Africa had the the flexibility that they could lose, and you know the world wasn't coming to an end. But if if there is an early injury to a back or somewhere where they're caught short in this game and it ultimately goes on to to cost them the match and the World Cup, that is, like, it's a career-altering moment for a coach like Razi Erasmus. It, like, it sums up just how big, how big a call this is, how big a risk, how big a reward it is, but how big a call it is to make this in a World Cup final. It's probably the biggest risk I've seen any coach take going into a, a, a World Cup final. And that's the... That's the beauty of the seven one. It's not like it's not immoral. It's it's a risk for for the team who do it, and obviously the reward can be really big. I mean, having seven potential forwards to, to come on could be game changer. But also, like he's he's taken a risk. He never replaced. Uh, well, he did replace Marks, but he replaced him with Andre Pollard. And like you saw against England, Bongi had to go eighty minutes. They're just not a hundred percent confident in Dion Fury as a hooker. I mean, he's got a couple of minutes, um, you know, here and there at the end of games, but the, the preference has been to bring him on as a, as a back row where he has been outstanding. So, I mean, I would say if Bongi was to get injured early um, and obviously if there's a back injury early, uh, which let's be honest, there, uh, it's, it's part of modern rugby. I mean, mm-hmm. there's an inherent risk there. Uh, it's a high collision sport. I think this plan um, comes under serious scrutiny. Um, now, having said that, I think, Every single one of those twenty-three players are are capable of having an impact on this game, um, and he has used his bench phenomenally well. I mean, when things were going bad against England, they made big calls and they worked out. You know what I mean? And I think the squad believe in him, they trust him, so that's a big factor. Um, but uh, yeah, like there was an opportunity after Ireland to give Quagga. In my understanding, memory of it, Quagga hasn't played any game time in the backs. You know what I mean? So if you were Really thinking about this, you know, um, would you have got him 10 minutes as a centre or whatever? So if he has to go into the back line, and let's be honest, New Zealand against Ireland um, in particular uh, showed that tactically they're very good at going after opposition weaknesses. So again, it gives, you know, that's something that they'll talk about today. They have the, the skill set to, to target whether that's through a kicking game or that's through a running game, if any of those forwards end up in the back line. So for me, it's a, it's a fascinating call. It could be the winning or losing of, of this final that I didn't expect to be talking about this morning, to be honest. Yeah, it's absolutely I think, we, I, I think as well, like um, the strength of the All Blacks has sort of been their, their line out defense. You know, they've, they've stemmed a lot of attacking flow. And, you know, if they lose Bongi early, mm. man, that's going to put a lot of pressure on a weapon that worked really well in Twickenham. Like that was the more I don't believe it. I don't even believe the seven one actually won that game. Like the that dismantled them physically through the lack of discipline and the opportunities the All Blacks gave them in that first half. Eventually, the they was, ran out of that, that game was that game was over before the benches were emptied. Like, exactly. So I don't. Yeah, I, I just think I don't know if they'll. Yeah, I just think it must end up a six two because and if it doesn't, credit to them. And if they if they win, man, like it is. It is so ballsy. Um, but the, what the All Blacks have to be careful of, if, if 
there is an injury. Um, we've got to be really astute with our tactical kicking. We don't want to, you know, we probably haven't faced the wet conditions. So our discipline has to come not only obviously defensively around penalties, but our discipline not to overplay, especially if there's a quagga or something out wide. And, um, you know, it's about manipulating and, and drawing him out of that defensive line ra rather than trying to go at him. Um, so I, I think it's a big day for our kicking game, especially if it's wet off the back of the England game. They should have seen the pressure that a South African back three were under. But I have to say, uncharacteristically, previously they've been pretty efficient in the air. And same with Mark Talia. You know, both back threes in particular, Mark, will get tested early from from Andre Pollard with with a few up and unders just from um, the semi final form. But um, the, the key is, I think, for the All Blacks, looking at this, like I'm enjoying it as a fan and talking about it, but it's actually just parking it to one side and focusing on what uh, the All Blacks can control mm -hmm. and control and believe in the game plan they've gone in and, and just see this as the white noise that it most probably will be. Yeah, Birch, James mentioned Mark Talia there and the high ball. And in the quarterfinal between South Africa and France, we saw South Africa score two tries from launching kicks over onto over onto. Uh, France's left wing and they dealt with them poorly and they got the nice ricochet and, and ran in a couple of scores. If you were the South African coaches and you saw Mark Talia second guess himself under a couple of high balls in the first half of that game on, on Friday night against Argentina, you'd, you'd be absolutely licking your lips, I'd say. Yeah, look, they, they'll go after that, but they would have went after that anyway. They backed themselves and I thought tactically against France, it was, it was really smart. I mean, they ran the ball back when most teams kick it back. They got to the middle of the field and then they put up really accurate kicks onto onto the wing with either Estebet, Peter Steph de Trois, de Trois or Khaleesi out there chasing. So they and they did it quickly. It wasn't it wasn't like your bog standard, slow it down, make a caterpillar rook and, and kick it. It was all on in movement. So very difficult to get a good kick escort. So Talia, look at he's not bad in the air. Um he didn't have a good night. Um and but likewise I think they'll be concerned about how vulnerable their back Two were or their wingers were in particular to to some very accurate kicking from England and some really good kick chase. So it is going to be a fascinating part of the game. Look, at, I think uh, as James said, it's not overplaying. Um, and uh, South Africa, New Zealand don't want to become too conservative because that would play into uh, South Africa's hands. But also they can't become too loose either uh, because under pressure that South African defence, particularly the, the jackal threats they have, will will isolate ball carriers and. It's a little bit different. I think New Zealand's defences look really good against Ireland and, and Argentina because both, both teams really struggle to get significant All Blacks off their feet at the breakdown. Um, so New Zealand were able to make two men hits but get out of there and, and tend to have 14 players on their, on their feet. Whereas you just imagine with that South African power and the ferocity of the cleaners coming in and you look at how South Africa play, they generally get bodies off feet which can create space. Um, it's going to be a, fa a fascinating battle. I, the only thing I'm just thinking now about at seven one because it caught me on the hop because we only heard about it as well, Neil, before he came on, mm. is has are they using feedback from the playing from the forwards in particular that their energy is is a little bit dipping? You know what I mean. So they've had massive games against France, massive games against England in, in consecutive weeks, a day less recovery. And like you even saw Estebet being taken off and he wasn't playing well, you know? Yeah, so 40, 45 minutes or yeah, so. Yeah. And I know Razzie takes people off early and stuff, but is is that a sign that, the, you know, they, they know their pack are going to be absolutely key to beating um, New Zealand. And effectively, the players have been really honest and, and said, look, we don't have the energy. I, I don't know if that happened, but I'm just trying to work out why you would gamble. Mm. Um, and, you know, maybe they feel they need that energy and they need more of it. They need one more body uh, coming on. But it's um, it's absolutely fascinating. I think, um, sorry to jump in, but just a couple of points off the back of that. The, your last one, uh, I agree with. In particular, not just the big games I've had in the World Cup, but they they sent the big squad to that Twickenham game, whereas the All Black players that played in that game actually hadn't played for a month because a lot of them got rested in the last few few matches they had before the World Cup, so they were a little bit rusty and off. But obviously, they had planned um, their loads throughout. But um, I think also what I'm interested in is both back three struggled, and it's easy to focus on say a Mark Talia or you know Cheslin Colby or, or the uh, Perno the French, but it's actually the work of uh, your midfields and your loose forwards and sometimes your hooker 
to bust a gut back and create that little pocket. You, you can't change your line, but you can turn and sprint and make sure that you're attacking, the person that attacks the air has that space. And England did that really well. Like they almost overdid it, to be honest. There was about eight or nine guys coming in to that pocket, which potentially is risky if the ref, you know, doesn't like or feels like you're changing your line. It, it is risky, but it's actually on those guys, especially in wet conditions, to do the work off the ball, it, it isn't celebrated by the public, but I tell you what, it could be the winning and losing of of this game. And and then on on top of that, you know, the other point about the All Blacks defence, sorry, I always jump in and around everything. No, um, but um, on the All Blacks defence, I think they've looked their best when they've made the most tackles. So when I say our tactical kicking, like don't underplay, but don't be afraid to put it down there and say, you've got a chance your arm. Because the Springboks are setting up, if you if you look at it, for tactical kicking and hoping for those opportunities that they snaffled against the French. But you know, like it's a it's a different, I, I would say different, you know, you know, atmosphere, different probably pinnacle event, nerves and so forth. So you can't rely on that. So yeah, I'm just mindful for the the All Blacks with Joe Schmidt and the work he's done with Scott McLeod. There's a as, as a lot of them have said this week, there's a system we believe in and we understand and, and we can go to, and they actually build confidence off it. And then off the back of that, our natural instinct is the counterattack when it's unstructured. So I think between defending, not playing too much rugby in our half, and then when we get those turnovers, have a lick, two or three uh, rucks, if we don't break them down, put it back down there, back ourselves to get another turnover and, and just stay in that sort of chess match until, you know, hopefully you know, from my point of view, the South African sides make the mistakes. Yeah, and like finding the balance in how much you attack and how much you kick is probably the the really tricky and interesting part, Birch, where like against against Ireland, New Zealand kicked the leather off the ball and they did it absolutely brilliantly for pretty much the entire game. And it was like a really, really strong foundation of the, the whole performance, kicked it well, chased it well, put Ireland under pressure, won back a good few balls, but... The flip side then is maybe against South Africa where looks like it probably will be a showery or a bit wet of a night again. Maybe not as bad as it was on, on Saturday, but if you if you do that a lot, there's a fair chance that's probably going to end up leading to more scrums on a wet night. There's probably going to be a few more drop balls. And do you want to present the opportunity of a lot more scrums in a game like that against against uh, against South Africa? Like South Africa, I think it was 14 scrums between South Africa and England the other night five scrums in the entire game between New Zealand and, and Ireland, a nice dry evening. Finding the balance is probably tricky, isn't it? Yeah, it is tricky, but look at Dave. They've, they've got experienced halfbacks and, and they've got experienced coaches and I think they'll have a very clear uh, plan around that and obviously they can adapt it as the game goes then because they have the skill set. The beauty of the All Blacks is they have the skill set to do both and uh, the framework to do both, whereas to be fair to England, they literally that's that's what they do and I, and I agree with James I mean their kick escort was as good as you've seen at any level and it, and it was a perfect reminder to South Africa about how they probably didn't work that hard but the, the only thing is you know James said they overdid it they overdid it because they're not going to try and run it back you know what I mean so whereas <laughs> most most teams they're sending two guys to to wit they send guys to the midfield to try and maybe have a look at playing back so England were never going to play it back so um it it get it gets you better protection, but it limits your chance of doing that now. So it's that balance between between protecting that catcher and being able to actually fire a shot on the way it, it, when you when you catch it or if you catch it. So it's uh but again it's another element of the game. I mean, are the box are the box happy not to play uh, this weekend and only play off turnover and transition like we saw for that, you know, Jesse Creel kick for Kobe against France. I mean, they can fire into into um into shape or into life very quickly and they have some X-Factor players with a lot of pace to do that or, uh, as, as the All Blacks do. So one one bouncing high ball could turn this game. I mean, it's a it's a toss of a coin or it's a, or if it's a Wayne Barron scrum decision um, could 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 decide to work up. I don't, I don't think the All Blacks should worry scrummaging on their ball. You know what it's yeah. like. Yeah. Hook a quick hook straight to the back, get it out if you're struggling. Where they've got to be really mindful and I think just not to harbour on these escorts is getting that right. And I think you probably, at maximum, you need two. Escorts can do a good enough job to create that pocket to get you to win the ball. And you've just got to have it all night because it'll be that knock-on. Or if you get your up and unders wrong and it's a, it's a mark, 
that and they've gone too far into the 22. We've seen them call that scrum from 80 out and they milk a penalty. That's those are the errors that they they won't want and will play into the South African's hands. Mm. Let's move it on to the to the set piece because it was going to be big anyway with a seven one split in the South Africa team. It's it's an even bigger area now. But uh we'll start on line out because against both Ireland and Argentina, New Zealand did a, a cracking job on the line out, uh, on, on attacking ball and defensive ball. Uh, more importantly, on defensive ball, though, because they disrupted Ireland early on and did the exact same thing to Argentina. South Africa had some issues as well against England. Like, James, do you see that as an area where New Zealand can have a go, particularly early on? Do you potentially see Sam Whitelock getting the start again this week just just for the, the line out ability alone? I think they want I think they want the big experience vet to come on late, personally. So I think he'll come off the bench. And the reason I say that is because uh Ritalik and Barrett started the test match at Mount Smart in Auckland earlier um this year where we got hundred percent um on our ball and we disrupted them down to about 70%. So stole a lot of their line outs and stole a lot early. And we got that scoreboard pressure, which forced them to sort of change tact and chase the game. And um, that was enough, I suppose, of a rhythm break to not allow them to catch back up. Um, so that, that I believe, should be an area. Normally, I would say uh, kick, kick deep, like kick deep, but not too far out that maybe, you know, they, they're interested in a quick throw or you just keep it that you can roll it out, so forth. And then when it's your ball, try and not let them kick into the stands, catch it and do the quick throw so you don't go to their strength. But I'm not sure if it is their strength uh, at the moment. And uh, the All Blacks have got to have that confidence from Mount Smart. That was the most clinical 40 minutes um, of a big test match um, I've seen from the All Blacks prior to that quarterfinal. It was it was physical. Shannon Brazil was straight up the guts. We were dominating at set piece. Yes, you know, we we fell off a cliff energy wise towards the end of the game, but the damage was done, and that's all you need. You got to win by one point this weekend. It doesn't matter. No one will care how you win. Um, they they just want to win. So absolutely, I, I feel that's a weapon. And I, I look, I feel attacking scrum could be a weapon. Someone like Artie Savia with a quick hook with a pack that is looking to scrum through you with his speed and power. It may actually help you because they'll put their heads up and take their shoulder off, which isn't in their DNA, so they probably won't. But it does give that advantage to get into that channel one with an Aaron Smith quick ball to a Geordie Barrett or Rico Arnie. We've seen flat, you know, flat to the line, draws that defence in, and then that one out the back to a Richie Moana with Will Jordan sort of coming around his shoulder. That that's that can be a real weapon, that set-piece scrum time, if we can get that quick hook and go right in wet conditions. Birch, how how easily do you see them being able to get that quick ball, particularly later on in the game when you've got someone like Ox and Che coming on? I know you were absolutely blown away with what he did in the final, whatever, half an hour against England on Saturday. Look, it's his ability to generate power from a poor body position, which is, is scary. I don't know if I've seen a loose head as destructive in a while. Um, and uh, England, in fairness, they changed their selection policy to pick the two best scrummers to start. And I thought... Uh, Marler and, and um, Dan Cole did a phenomenal job of locking it out but just just that en- that extra power Vincent Cock did a great job on Ellis Genge as well to be fair and it allowed Nietzsche uh, you know go to town on, on Kyle Sinclair and it became very disruptive and Jamie George went 80 as well and he's the best scrummage hooker in England and um, they just couldn't once you once they showed a weakness there uh, both to Ben O'Keefe and um, to the South African forwards, England were were screwed, and I, I don't know. I mean, I'd love to know James's opinion on on the replacement props for for New Zealand in terms of their scrummaging power, because I think this game will go into the last quarter, and um, the All Blacks have now got a little bit of uh, a taste for blood, you know, against France, obviously taking that mark, bringing that pack all the way down, then winning the penalty, and obviously against England, it was a it was a, a marked. Uh, a remarkable performance. I mean, do you think the New Zealand ace last quarter can can hold on, on a South African ball? Can they hold that spring uh, back? Definitely, like Newell is a proven power tight head. Like he 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 definitely um, is. Uh, Williams is 
very proven at Super Rugby level, but getting better and better each time he gets on at that Test match level. I thought it was probably his best performance scrum time last last week against Argentina. This is a different beast. So do you look at an Ofotonga Fassi who is a strong man and has that ability and strength and power and size to lock out that loose head? Um, I don't think they will. I think I think they'll probably stick with Williams, but the, it'll be a, it'll be a true test um, for. And they they're young. I suppose the only thing about youth is there's no baggage, yeah. you know, like there's there's nothing uh, to hold them back, um, and they've got some confidence off, off last week. But I think you'll see uh, the coaches try to uh, ring a little bit more out of the group um, and Lomax, and probably Taylor for, for that for that point, and, and bring all three on with a Coles in the middle. Um, but as we know, the back five is so important as well. Yeah. The grunt that you get from the back five will, will determine how well you. You go so um, yeah. It's 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 going to be it's going to be a big job. And I, I was just thinking as you were talking, man. There's an opportunity for the Springboks early. Everyone assumes on their ball they're going to go for it and try and milk a penalty, try to set a standard with Wayne Barnes. But you, you know what it's like when you're strug- you're struggling at scrum time. It's like well, I I certainly do as a hooker because I'm the one that's getting folded. You turn to your Lucy's and say, "Don't you dare come off. You you stay on for as long as possible." Tighten your backs in. If they kick, it'll get a long pass. Let's just back up fitness and we'll get there. And we'll, we're better off losing 15 metres versus getting a penalty and you know potential yellow card because the refs had enough. But if they're so fixated on staying on, there's actually an opportunity for the Springboks to just go themselves and change the picture on the All Blacks, which would create a lot of thinking early, I believe. James, I totally agree with you, but I think there's a... Um, a lesser chance of that than Razi going eight oh, zero. Yeah. Honestly, like because <laughs> yeah. that would uh, yeah. they, they, it's such a mantra for them and it's such a part of their psych- uh, psychology that they would rather stay there all day and uh, then actually play off that. But you're right; it, it should create an opportunity. Yeah, and, and I must agree. If I was that dominant, I, I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be saying. I'm saying I'm not quick hooking. I'm going to look to go over the top here. Exactly. Yeah. The next, the next part on on set piece, so we're kind of gone, you know, disrupting the line out scrum, and then moving it on to to the mall. And in that game in Twickenham in August, it was in the the start of the game when, uh, like New Zealand lost it pretty much in those first twenty minutes, eight nil penalty count after sixteen seventeen minutes plus two yellow two cards, yellow cards yeah. yeah, and three or four of those penalties at least were for taking out lifters in the line out. And going back to England and South Africa on Saturday, England did a great job stopping the South Africa mall because they got away with probably stopping or taking out a couple of those lifters just a, a fraction of a second too early, but quick enough that it was going to be able to stop them all. New Zealand have to find that balance between getting those South Africa players just as they're hitting the ground off the line out and not being obvious enough that Wayne Barnes is going to start picking it off. Yeah, I think... Where, where they've got to get the balance right is when they stay down and when they go up. When they've struggled is when they've gone up and they can't get down fast enough and get the weight. And almost because the ball's gone over, look at me. I'm, <laughs> like, <clears throat> for people that can't see this, I'm, I'm actually going to line up. But um, you sort of go over, the ball goes over, and then they try to hit that angle there. And they've almost shorn them around the corner. And, and there's you know poor old Cody Taylor got yellow carded against um, Ireland because he, he had no choice. Like, it was going over. Maybe the, maybe it is better to just let them go over if that happens because, you know, you're not going to be able to deal with the yellow card if that's the sort of Twickenham effect that, that we've seen. So if they go up, they've got to get it. I yeah, think just, otherwise you're just better off staying down. Yeah, just on that. So the, the, one, the, the penalty try, they went up and just missed it and Ireland scored easily. The, the one that we didn't score that um, Barrett Jordan held Barrett. up. Yeah, Jordi they stayed down, and in fairness, if you watch that mall, Ireland barely took them a long time to get it going. Um, and you know there might be an argument that they should have played away from it. So that's definitely something. But just interestingly, I think South Africa will go after New Zealand at the mall. And I don't know if you saw this during the week, but this French scrum, uh, forwards coach Karim Gazelle, he was interviewed and he spoke about what they saw in New Zealand if they had managed to play New Zealand in the final. And, and he actually said that they were going to maul them. Or try and maul them uh, a lot, and they actually practiced during the summer with Anton Dupont throwing in, um, because New Zealand tend to mirror defense, and they thought he could win the ball at the front, 
and DuPont had been throwing to the front and then they would have had the hooker as the plus one. So the hooker is a classical scrum half. So Movak or Marchand, if he was back, just smashing that. And they were actually happy to win the ball to the front and try and maul the All Blacks. So it's just an interesting look. at It would have been a massive gamble to, to do it. And maybe it only would have worked once or twice or New Zealand would have covered off that front. But it was a sign that France, when they looked at New Zealand, thought maybe they were a little bit vulnerable at that maul D. England, I agree with you, Neil, did a phenomenal job. But it's more in their DNA, to be fair. Like, it's it's part of Bortwick's uh, mantra. It's the premiership. It's, it's Northern Hemisphere rugby. I think that is going to be a, a fascinating part of the game. Um, and if New Zealand can stop the box there, um, they're going to be a long way towards winning the game. I think when we win it, um, when the, the opposition win it in the middle, it's, it's a lot easier, you know, because you've got your sort of big boppers there to be square. I agree with you. It's... It's the back which hasn't helped, but we have also struggled around the front. Mm. And it's that that teams almost use our weight and our excitement to get in there. Because you've you've if it, if it's one at the front, you should ideally hoover it to the sideline so they fall on top of themselves. But if you don't do that, you, your weight almost pushes them around. And if they're strong enough, there's there's no stopping that. Yeah, that's um, that's, that, and, that's that's exactly James. Sorry, that's exactly what they planned. So they planned by having the hooker hit it quickly to win the race, to get past the, that, that New Zealand. And effectively, they, they nearly spin you forward um, and get you going. But we'll try moving on quickly because we are running out of time here. Uh, very quickly, <laughs> break, breakdown. Obviously, New Zealand were outstanding against Ireland as well. And that was another massive area of the game. Do, do you think they have an edge over South Africa potentially there? Just with the way Artie Savvy and Sam Kane and, and Shannon Frizzell are performing at the moment? I think um, it's definitely on par. Like, the Springboks have got a lot of men that can get over the ball. So do we. We've shown that. Um, I think the rain may um, be critical in your decisions around the breakdown because when it's wet, if you show any instability or, you know, you're holding your body weight on that grass, you're going to get pinged. And not to revert back to the mall, but the best form of defence to a driving mall is not giving away penalties so they can kick into your 22. And and I think the discipline, whoever has the discipline to not overplay their hand at the breakdown, get double shoulders on in the wet, you're always going to win that um, space battle defensively in the wet as well because the passes are a little bit slow, people are tighter, you know. So it's it's not so much the defensive tackle, it's when you, like, it has to be a golden opportunity. Like, I wouldn't be entering a defensive breakdown unless it was on a platter in the wet because if you risk falling off your feed or falling over the side or showing a picture Barnes doesn't like um, it can it can lead to those more opportunities we've just spoken about and the like the the Wayne Barnes element Birch obviously is is really important because it, it is fascinating when you have a when you get to this stage of a tournament like last week where we had Ben O'Keefe refing South Africa two weeks in a row and the immediate thought you have in your head is okay that's obviously an advantage but looking back at it now Ben O'Keefe had probably done his homework a little bit more on things he might have missed the previous week on South Africa. And, you know, Wayne Barnes refereed New Zealand and, and Ireland a couple of weeks ago. So there's the potential either that he's very, very comfortable with what New Zealand are doing and New Zealand are comfortable with him, or he might have looked at a handful of things that maybe he missed that afternoon that he might be a bit stricter on on this week. Yeah, and I rang a few coaches who've had Wayne Barnes in this World Cup um, this week just to see like, because I was fascinated to see what does he give people clues in the dressing room. I mean, what he's really hot on and what he's looked at, and apparently, no, he's he's all praise for everybody. Everyone, you're all great. You're all given. You're all so easy to referee, and then you go out and he obviously you he's obviously very hard in one area. Um, so I don't think both teams are going to have to guess. I mean, what his review of that New Zealand game was like, um, or what he sees in the box. Um, and he is very experienced. So. Um and I, I still believe he's a good referee. Uh I just think the game is so hard to referee at the moment when you have countries as well matched as France, New Zealand, South Africa, Ireland, etc. That um and the game is moving so fast. It's it's incredibly difficult to get being right. I don't think we, we should expect him to. Um uh but yeah, it, it is gonna be fascinating to see what what he sees in the first 20 minutes and who who adapts to that best. Right. Verdict time. Who's going to call us? Who's lifting the, the Webb Ellis Cup on Saturday night? Spurge, I'll start with you. 
Oh God, I was I was all about South Africa before this seven one. Now um now I'm veering towards New Zealand. I think if if they start seven one, it's too big a risk. Uh, no sub hooker really, no sub nine. Um, it's uh, for me. It's, t- it's that decision is tipped it towards New Zealand. And James. Yeah, look, I'm on the All Black train. I have been, even when there were doubters uh, after the Irish series and so forth, you know we've got the quality players. It's just stepping up the big moment. And I think Richie Moanga will be critical. And I've never seen, actually, I don't really want to say this now, but I'll touch wood, but I've never seen him in a finals performance. And I know just at Super Rugby, he lifts. He just, he fronts and he lifts. So uh, expect a big game from Richie and, and the All Blacks get, get up in a tight one. Yeah, it's going to be absolutely brilliant. And I I, I was feeling a little bit lukewarm on the whole thing for the last week or so with Ireland gone. But now that I saw that team this morning, I'm I'm just very much back on. It's all excitement. But um, that's it from this podcast. We'll be back for one more pod next week to, to put a bow on this whole Rugby World Cup. But before that, obviously, New Zealand against South Africa, 8 o'clock kickoff, Rugby World Cup final on Saturday night, live on RT2 and RT Player coverage underway at 7 o'clock. Fellas, thanks a million for joining us and uh, we'll speak to you again soon. Thanks, man. Thanks, Lance. Enjoy luck. the Best weekend. Luck, Bye-bye. The RTE Rugby World Cup Podcast. Sponsored by Bank of Ireland.